Well, good evening. My name's Pastor Rick. How are you guys tonight? It's good to see you guys. You know, this morning was a little rough. I couldn't remember what Alexa's name was as I was trying to like wake up and turn the alarm off. <laughs> but you know, um, man, I love, I feel like it's like, ah, oh, this is Southern California. That's why we pay the premiums around here because of this great weather. So it's nice to have the lights turned on for us. Well, we are finishing tonight the letter to the Galatians. Next week, Ephesians will be in Ephesus next week. But this week, we're finishing the letter to the Galatians. Um, so please join me in Galatians chapter 6. And we're starting in verse 9 tonight. And we'll finish up the chapter. So here we are in um, Galatians 6, starting at verse 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to this world, excuse me, to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails you, avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, be with your spirit. Amen. Well, let's stop there and pray. Heavenly Father, we wish to see you, Jesus. We want to grow closer to you, Lord. Thank you for the truth of scripture that we have tonight. Thank you for a safe place to worship, Lord. And thank you for our kids having a blast right now, God. Just thank you for all the great gifts you give us right from heaven. In Jesus' name, we all agreed by saying, amen, amen. Well, last week we were shown that we need to use our freedom in Jesus to serve and love. Tonight, we're told not to grow weary. And then we see Paul just kind of summarize everything. He puts it in a nice little box and puts a neat little bow on it. And he ends the letter. So not to grow weary. Not to lose heart. Um, it's talking about not quitting. Here's some famous quotes on not quitting. Winston Churchill, the bulldog. Winston Churchill once said, Never give up on something that you can't go a day without thinking about. Winston Churchill got Great Britain through the World War. Thomas Edison said, Our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always try just one more time. Martin Luther King Jr. said, If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Albert Einstein, he said, it's not that I'm so smart. It's just that I stay with problems longer. Maya Angelou said, continue. Be loving and be strong. Be fierce and be kind, and don't give in and don't give up. And tonight, we're learning about not growing weary, not losing heart. The big idea tonight is, yes, enjoy this freedom we have that Christ offers. Do good to others. Remember, it's not about what you can do. It's about what Jesus did. That's what this letter is all about. We're not to grow weary. We're not to lose heart. 
Paul is just finishing up this letter, like I said, kind of summarizing everything. And he's telling us, just don't quit in doing these good things. Enjoy all this freedom that you have and use it to love and to not grow weary. Tonight, we're going to spend quite a bit of time in verses 9 and 10 as we walk up, as we wrap up the chapter. We're going to talk a lot about preventing weariness, if we can, managing it more so. So how do you know if you're weary? If, if you're already saying, hey, I'm already feeling ti- tired tomorrow, yeah, you might be a little weary. If you're not really an early bird and you're not really a night owl, but some kind of permanently exhausted pigeon, you're a little bit weary. If you're tired is tired, yeah, you might be a little weary, but do good. Do good. Don't lose heart. We're going to kind of see how Paul has been these last couple of chapters focusing on relationships. If you'll remember, this letter to the Galatians has predominantly dealt with telling people that you're saved by grace. See, there, when Paul had shared the gospel, people are like, on fire for Jesus. We believe we're saved. We're a new creation. Praise God. Well, Paul leaves, and these guys that come in, and they want to make these new believers, these people that are claiming saved by grace and enjoying that, they say, no, you have to be circumcised like we Jews are. We need you to start following all these dietary laws. Paul catches wind of this and being a great pastor to, this, to these people, fires off this letter and he says, what are you guys doing buying into all of that silliness? Oh, foolish Galatians. You can only have right standing before God by having faith in Jesus Christ. It is by grace, a free gift, a free blessing that you get that we don't deserve. That's how you're made whole. It's only through Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him, which is why we've been learning. It's not about what we can do. It's not about our performance. It's about what Jesus did. It's about, not performance, but God's promises. Okay? So with all that freedom, we're to, ha- we're to love. We're to church, we're to restore, as we learned, uh, I think it was last week, when we're restoring one another in gentleness and humility, kind, being gentle with, with people as we restore them. Okay? And while you're doing these good things, he says, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Um, Lose heart, uh, get worn out, become discouraged. This is the kind of thing that does happen over time. It's like work becomes hard. It becomes a little painful. It's like feeling a little unfinished, maybe a little unrewarded. It can grow tiring doing good all the time. Um, and Paul's trying to encourage these Galatians, like, don't, don't, don't get so stressed out. Don't get so, um, don't get so burned out. I'm, you know, he's like, you're going to reap the reward. We talked about that spiritual, that spiritual law, kind of like the physical law of gravity. There's a spiritual law that you reap what you sow. Okay, so we have to consider what we want to harvest, right? We consider what we harvest, and that helps us determine what we're going to plant. We're playing a long game here. It's not, we're, we're not just trying to do things for this short-term reward. The things that we do as believers to, to share the love of Jesus, these things matter, not just for, you know, a few minutes or um, a week, But for eternity, for eternity, the Bible encourages us in this serving process. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 15. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong, immovable, always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 58. 
if we're doing something for the Lord, it's never useless. You know, I've been joking the last few weeks. Oh, yeah, kids, yes, they're playing video games. Think about what the kids are going to grow up with. They're not going to think, man, my church was boring growing up. My mom and dad made me go all the time. They're going to be like, uh, we used to play this like 15-foot screen on Mario Kart. And then we would like do a Bible study. Yeah, they should have fun in church. It's okay to laugh and have a good time. And it's okay for our young adult leaders up there to be enthusiastic while they're doing it. I see people serving around this church and they are sometimes bent over laughing. And it's like, guys, are we getting any work done around here? It is so much fun to to be around other uh, bros and sisters in the Lord and serving and having a great time. Knowing that nothing that we do for the Lord is ever useless. So if you're in ministry and you're serving, those of us that are weekly doing the thing, you're, whatever God has put your hand to in ministry, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 58 is such a great encouraging verse. To combat weariness, you're, getting, you're combating it, right? We've talked about a little bit um, uh, managing it. Check this out, what Isaiah 40 says. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Tired? Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fatigued? Tired? Wait on the Lord. Now that doesn't mean sit on the couch and just kind of binge watch some Netflix. However, I'm a big fan of The Chosen, and you can binge that and totally get pumped and be like, oh, that's amazing. I'm just throwing it out there. But, you know, if you're just going to be a bump on a log, well, the Lord will just move when he moves. Yeah, that's not what I'm talking about here. Actively waiting is like actively recalling God's promises. Like that, the things we do for the, in the Lord are never useless. Like when we are waiting on him, meditating, thinking deeply on him, when we're con- staying connected with him, our strength will be renewed, refreshed. You know, and um, waiting looks different. Waiting might be you're around other Christians just kind of enjoying that laughter and that joy. Okay? And you're around them. And they're praying for you. Maybe you're praying for them. Maybe you're just hanging out. Okay? Maybe waiting looks like reading some scripture, remembering those promises. Sometimes, after I drop my... Well, even when I'm going to drop my kids off from school, for school, I I do drop-offs. We do some worship music, and sometimes I am full-on having a concert in my truck. And my my teenager now is like, Dad, please turn down the radio. We're getting close to the drop-off. And I am full-on, like, you know how Gentry rocks oceans? I am, like, rocking oceans in my truck. It's like, turn it down, Dad. I'm like, no, I'm going to roll down the windows. It's going to be great. Waiting on the Lord looks a little different, okay? It does. So I don't want anybody to come up here and put some kind of weird trip on you guys that you have to wait this way. I don't know. Just stay close to the Lord. Now, that's one way to wait on the Lord to avoid some type of like, I guess like some spiritual fatigue. You want to stay connected. Physically, we get tired, huh? I know I do. If you find yourself constantly getting tired, you guys know that I'm not a doctor, but there's some things that I've read and I've practiced and I've heard people a lot smarter than I share it, is we should be doing a few things like eating well. Go figure, you can eat well. Maybe get good sleep if you can. Good sleep. Exercise. Go out for walks if you can. Eat well. Sleep well, exercise, that seems to combat fatigue. Fatigue being a leading cause of depression. Get out there, get moving, eating well. When I was in my late teens, I used to be able to stay up all night hanging out with my buddies. Then we'd go hit Jack in the Box at about 2 in the morning, and I'd get two big cheeseburgers. And then I'd wake up at 6 to be to the station to work. I would die if I tried to do that. You just can't not sleep, not eat well. And, and I just can't do it. Those, like, 20 nothings, they can, but I cannot anymore. We've got to eat well. 
sleep well, get some exercise. Maybe you're hanging out with some friends while you're doing it. And what a friend we have in Jesus, right? What a friend we have in Jesus. You know what Jesus said? He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, Jesus said. Come to Jesus. Come to me. I will. Not I might. Depends on how the weather is. No, no, no. I will give you rest. You will find rest. Great encouraging verse. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. If you're weary, if you're burdened, come to Jesus. Don't grow weary while doing good. If you're getting weary, take Jesus' yoke upon you. Now, I know whenever we talk about the yoke, that's like this um, kind of mustache-looking thing that hangs on the oxen that, they're, like, that the farmer gets behind. He ties them on the oxen, the oxen pulls. It's what keeps the oxen in line. Jesus doesn't say, hey, let me do this so I can work you a little longer. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, take my yoke upon you. He's basically saying, I never meant for you to carry all your problems by yourself. That's not how it was designed. That's not how it's set up. He says, let me help you, is what he's saying. Let me help you. Jesus, God the Son, raised from the dead three days later. Let me help you, he's saying. Let's team up. Partner with me, Jesus said. Come to me. No, I'm okay. I'll do it on my own. I did that for many years. I got nowhere. But when we partner with Jesus, it's like, man, the lights turn on. Like, he totally breathes life into us. He helps us carry the load. Again, come to me takes a, take, can take on, can look like a variety of applications. How you spend time with Jesus might be a little different than how I spend time with him. Adam, back on the very left side of the Bible in the first few chapters of the Bible, he got to see God walking in the cool of the garden. Adam got to just talk with the Lord then. How cool is that? Uh, David, think about his time with the Lord. King David, he was a kid. In shepherding, out in the shepherd fields, getting inspired. Sometimes he was freaking out, getting wearied and burdened as he was hiding in caves. Believe me, he was spending some time with the Lord. Started writing psalms. His spending time with the Lord looked a little different. Jesus, he would go off himself to spend time with his dad. He would just, see you guys, hang out here, I'll be back. And he would just go off to spend time with the Lord. He hung out in a garden too, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember when he's connecting with the Lord? Maybe for you, it looks like you get up a little earlier before the kids. That's what it kind of looks like for me sometimes. Sometimes I'm just out walking around. Sometimes I'm driving in my truck, just praying, taking some time. I don't know, but I just want to be so sensitive to to how you spend time with the the Lord. I don't want you guys to to think, oh, I have to do it this way that I heard the, the guys on the radio say. Or I have to do it this way. I have to be out in the wilderness uh, walking or hiking or may God bless you if you're doing that but you know what just remember it's not about what you can do it's about what Jesus already did God has already said I the Lord your God am with you wherever you go so what do I have to do start talking with the Lord he's with you now if you got a house full of kids and they're all getting crazy you, you know what get some time alone <laughs> wake up before them stay up later than them I get it However, get connected with the Lord. Get connected with the Lord. Because while we're doing good, what are we doing? We're pouring out. Think about it. You're driving. Gaslight comes on. Keep driving. What happens? Car turns off. Then you really get wearied and tired and burdened on when you're starting to push. And then you're in, the, you're in a pretty public area being in Southern California, so someone has to stop, and they're going to help you push too, and now they're going to get tired. Look what happens when your tanks run empty. Everybody gets tired. 
So we need to be filling up the tanks. How we fill up the tanks is we spend time with the Lord. Get pumped up and get filled up with him. Get into scripture. Get into a prayer group. Get into hanging out with some guys. Listen to worship. Sing worship. God gave you a voice. He wants to hear it, guys. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We have these kids that serve around the church. And they, they serve in a program called the Ministry Youth Training Program. Okay? And so uh, I tell the kids, like, hey, to be a part of it, once a month you have to do this thing called a Bible focus sheet. And so what that is, is it requires the kids to sit in some type of service. Maybe they're with their folks going through a devotional. Maybe they're sitting at chapel or part of our youth group. But they have to fill this out and turn it into me so I can read it and make sure that they're staying fed. And I always tell them, you know, I, I have a couple of favorite restaurants And I don't go to the restaurants where the chefs don't eat. You ever gone to a restaurant where the chef is just starving and malnutritioned? No. You want someone who's like tasted a bunch of different stuff and they know how to lay it down on a plate. Those are the best. So I always tell them, I'm not looking for some crazy skinny chefs. I want you guys to be fed and I want you guys to pour out. And so how we do that as believers is we stay connected with the Lord getting into his word, singing and worshiping, just praying, hanging out with other believers, getting pumped, staying connected because he's the vine, we're the branches. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And remember he said at the end of verse 9, I know that we're still in verse 9, for in due season we shall reap. We have fruit trees at my house and they're not all giving out fruit every single day. In due season, they come. In due season, they come. In due season, fruit is going to be bearing from our lives, believers. Hebrews tells us, God is not unjust. God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him. How hard you have shown. Excuse me, how... I can't read tonight. How you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers, as you still do. He's not going to forget what you've done as you're serving him. He will not forget. He's fair. He's got you. He's totally thinking about you. We'll go on to verse 10. Therefore, so knowing all this, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. To all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. As we're waiting for this reaping, waiting for this harvest, we're to be busy doing good. We're to be busy doing good. And I love that it says to all. Because there is a lot of opportunity around us. It says to all. All these opportunities to be used by God to share his love. There's tons of opportunities to do so. If you're like wondering, like, I don't know, like, really, is there something for me? There is. God has something for you in store that you probably might be already doing. You know, I think about doing, think, like, how can we be doing good? How does this apply to us? Well, I thought about spouses at first. Spouses, you have freedom in Jesus? Well, to love and serve one another. How does that look? And I'm not kidding, I totally thought about this verse as I was looking at my trash can filling up. I'm all, oh, I'll do it later, I'll do it later. And I'm like, don't you have that in your notes? So I threw it out. You can throw out the trash, you can pick up the socks, you can do other stuff, spouses, to just serve and love. Maybe it's not something physical. Maybe it's just sitting back, relaxing with your spouse, and just listening. I am totally trying not to look at my wife right now. As I'm, like, talking to everybody, I'm, like, looking above. Because she's like, yes, you should. You should totally do that. (laughs) Oh, thank you, Lord, for a joyful church and amazing wife. Okay, so moms and dads. Moms and dads. Oh, 
There's tons of opportunity, isn't there, moms and dads? Sometimes you just feel like an Uber service for your kids. Oh, totally, I do sometimes. And they don't even tip or give you a five-star review. They just whine a little more. But we have, we're not supposed to grow weary, are we? Are we? What about at work? What about at work? You're doing these routines every day, helping your coworkers. You're uh, doing all this extra stuff to make clients happy. You're doing all this extra stuff to take care of your supervisors or, or the people that you supervise. And it's like, wow, I'm not seeing that reaping all the time. But God does promise it comes in good season. And you know what, believer? God bless you guys. We need more believers in the workplace, in, in civil service, in, in nonprofit stuff. We need more. We need more men and women of integrity that are serving more than just their boss. We need you guys, us. We need to be out there and, and serving because we, uh, we work as unto the Lord. We, we are not supposed to be growing weary, right? And, and he obviously knows that this is a thing that happens. That's why God put it in the Bible. He knows that this happens. So if you're out there working right now, you know, like just serve, love. God gives you a freedom. Use it to serve and love. Last on my list, but definitely not least, caretakers. Caring for a spouse or a parent or a loved one that's now in your, in your care. I mean, there's so many like opportunities. And it's way more than a full-time job. As I've seen my, my family members, my parents, uh, we've seen our parents taking care of our grandparents over the years before they went on to that side of eternity. More than a full-time job. Keep serving. Don't grow weary knowing that you're, do, you're doing this for the Lord. He loves you. It's an important job what you're doing. You're not alone. He loves you and knows what you're going through and, and hears your prayers. There's so many opportunities, right, to do good to all. And then he goes, especially to those of the household of faith. So there's so many opportunities to flex these muscles. And now there's a, he ta starts talking about the church and the body. You know, and I love that. Like when he says this, what it, I want to be sensitive that it doesn't say, I'll just read my notes so I don't mess it up. They highlight for us believers that it, it, yes, it does show a priority to those of faith, but it doesn't take our, away our responsibility to show God's love to unbelievers, okay? You guys catch that? Yes, there's a priority here, but it does not take away the responsibility to show God's love to unbelievers. There's a lot of cool things here happening at the church. We have amazing ushers. They're like, the ushers and like the, the people that check in at kids' ministry, they're like our first friends. Seriously, when we came years ago, the ushers and the kids' men check-in people, they were mine and Sydney's first friends as we came to church. And man, there's so much going on, too. We got amazing sound guys and video guys. We have people making duplication. We have prayer teams going on throughout the church. We have women's ministry. We have this awesome knitting club that happens bunch of great ladies that, that meet throughout the week. Um, what else? We have married couples, men's studies. Man, there is an amazing, thriving community here at the church. Plug in. Plug in, right? We have a church of a few thousand people, and you can make it really small by coming to a study, getting to know someone. Getting involved with ushers. Man, they are instant. It's an instant family, that usher team. It's great. Yeah, that's how you make a church small. If you're like, well, I'm kind of new, then come to a prayer group or get involved in a real small group study. There, the bulletin's filled with them. And there are some amazing people here at this church with crazy, amazing stories. You wouldn't believe it. But they're so great. So enjoy. You're weary? Come and plug in and get just totally like encouraged by one another. I don't know where I can connect. Well, you know what? Come see me. Let's pray about it and talk about it and then get you plugged in. I'm serious. Come see me throughout the week. Come see me. So verse 12, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you 
to uh, be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Oh, I skipped verse 11. I realized I just did that. It's a quick one. Let me tell you. Verse 11, he goes, hey, look at the bold print, guys. I'm emphasizing this. These are big letters that I'm writing here. I'm about to sum it all up for you guys. So now, verse 12. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross. Here's what he's saying. There's those who are trying to force you to be circumcised because they want to look good. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ is what saves us. Remember, there's these first century Jews, these Judaizers, okay, that have infiltrated Paul's pack here. And they're telling him, no, it's not that you're saved by grace. You have to be like us Jews. You got to follow all our dietary laws too. All our hygiene laws, all our these laws, all our those laws. And you remember that the law, it wasn't bad. It wasn't something bad that needed to be abolished. No, it was something good and necessary, but it was temporary. It went from law of Moses and stretched all the way to Messiah, Jesus. And it pointed, us to, pointed them to Jesus who fulfilled the law. Okay? He fulfilled the law. So the law had a, a job. It point people to Jesus. Reveal sin and point people to Jesus. Because Jesus' death on the cross, that's what saves us. That's what gives us right standing. These guys didn't want their fellow Jews to come after them if they were sitting there preaching like, no, it's about grace, it's about grace. They, they didn't want to suffer the same persecution that they're throwing at the first century church, what Paul was going through. They were worried what other Jews would think if their converts weren't circumcised and following all the law. Verse 13 says, For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Those guys, they can't even keep the law. They're 613 plus the thousands of oral uh, traditions. They can't even keep the law. They just want you to be another notch on your belt, Paul is saying. But God forbid that I should boast in, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the Lord has been crucified to me and I to the world. If I'm going to brag, Paul is saying, I'm not going to brag in how great you guys are or not great, I don't know. I'm not going to brag in that, or I'm not going to brag or boast in anything but what Jesus did on the cross. I read earlier this week that this term boasting uh, could be applied to like a military usage, like when uh, soldiers would boast in their army. I think about like people that will boast at the workplace in their equipment, their ability, they, they put all their trust in something so that they feel better about themselves. Maybe it's like they're, they're boasting in a way, in, in items or things that other people may have done that kind of gives them the confidence to face scary things and get ahead. Well, you know what? Paul's saying, I don't boast in any of that stuff. I boast in the cross. Because, remember church, it's not about what we can do. It's about what Jesus did. He saved us. He died on the cross for our sins. And as many as walk, verse 16, according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Peace and mercy be on everyone who is a new creation. When someone's bragging in the cross, they're a new creation. They're a new person in Christ. When you're starting to sound like, man, you know what Jesus did for me? Oh, that's a new creation. When you look back at the rear view and you can't even recognize the person way back there, new creation, God's done a work in you. And it's been God that's doing it. Boast in the cross. Share what Jesus has done. Make it known. Glorify him. Expose him like what Jesus has done. That's what Paul's getting at here. Not in what we can do. Not in the law. Brethren, he's wrapping this up for us. Oh, sorry. I love this verse in 17. I don't know why I'm skipping ahead. I'm so excited. It's the hot chocolate. 
Verse 17. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I don't want to be bothered anymore about this stuff, guys. That's what he says. Total translation. Quite frankly, I don't want to be bothered anymore by these disputes. Stop bugging me. I have far more important things to do, Paul says. That's what the New Living Translation, that's how they translate it. I have some serious living of faith to do, is what Paul is saying. I don't need these guys. I don't need any more proof. You know what? I bear on my body the scars for Jesus. I I do. That's what Paul's saying because he was beaten and thrown in prison. Paul was messed up, whipped. They almost killed him. Like they messed up Paul a few times. That's why he says, "I, I don't trouble me anymore about this stuff, guys. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, not just guys, but brethren, men and women, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So be it, he says. Grace, not rules. We're saved by the grace, God's free gifts, his blessings that we get that we don't deserve. Pastor Chuck Smith wrote in uh, Why Grace Changes Everything, Right now, Andrew, our our youth intern, him and I are going through that book together. And it's probably the fifth or sixth time I've read it. I'm not trying to show off. I'm just trying to say it's a must read. Why Grace Changes Everything by Chuck Smith. It's really cool. In it, he writes, it's love, not law. Love, not law, is the key to our relationship with God and one another. How perfectly fitting for this letter to the Galatians, huh? That we, that we um, are not justified, we, are not, we do not have right standing before God based on our following of the law, okay? It's love. God's love demonstrated on the cross for us while we were still sinners. It's love, not law, that's the key to our relationship, Chuck Smith says. Our relationship with God. He doesn't force us, he loves us. How cool. We're never, I've not seen people drawn to the Lord by telling him like he's some mean, angry guy or something like that. All the punishment stuff. No one gets drawn, they get more pushed. God wants to draw us in by his love and how kind he is. That's cool. And it's through that loving relationship that he gives us that he pours out through us. So he fills us up so we can pour out to one another. Do you have that relationship with the Lord? Do you want that relationship with the Lord? If you're sitting there and you're like, I want that. I want God's love. I want to know that all my sins are forgiven. Then we're going to pray with you right now as we close. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that you love us. That you pour your love upon us, God. That you've given us grace, God. This free gift that we get that we don't deserve, God. Thank you for the truth of Scripture, that we can have right standing before you, God of the universe, based on our belief in Jesus Christ. And if you've been sitting here and you're like, I want that. I want this kindness from God. I want this love from God. I I want a relationship with God. Then we'd like to pray with you. And we pray it every week because it's so powerful to ask the Lord into your heart. And it goes like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins, God. I surrender to you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me that love so that I can serve you from this day forward. And all of God's kids agreed by saying, Amen, Amen. Church, next week we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. If no one's told you that they love you, church, I love you guys. More importantly, God totally loves you guys. Don't forget your kids on the way out. All right, God bless you guys. Enjoy the evening.